Last week I said we're going to do a sermon a little different, and we are. I need some volunteers, all right? Now, I need an elder. Any elder? I'm clear on you. I do all the way up there. I need a professor or a highly educated person. Oh, here I am. A doctor will work. <laughs> <laughs> now I need somebody that has a problem reading, either an army guy, navy guy, or marine. I'll be the army guy. I'm just hand this thing back to the to the marine back there. <laughs> Bibles of Colossians, chapter 2, it's on page 1805, starting on verse 14, page 1805 in your pew Bible. This is important that when Paul wrote this, we're going to talk about testimonies, and we're going to have three testimonies today, we're going to have the doctor, the intellectual, we're going to have the atheist, and we're going to have the Christian talk about his testimonies, and we're going to relate that, one, to the card that you have, the others to who and what we see in the card. But starting off in Colossians 3, I'm sorry, Colossians 2, verse 14, having wiped out the handwritten of requirements that was against us, which is contrary to us, and he, Christ, has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumph over them on it. So let no one judge you in food or drink regarding a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but a substance of Christ. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you. Have your way in your service today. Lord, we surrender into you. We thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, the testimony that we have, many a times we're judged. We are judged and we take it to the next level. Sometimes we get upset and sometimes we don't know where and things are happening. So, in these testimonies, we're going to talk about them a little bit, and then we're going to get to the card. Now, here's the challenge for you to have the card. And this is where I want you to pay attention to. There's a mistake on that card. Now, when I ask you to look at it, and when you read it, I want to see, don't blur it out, don't say it, if you find it. But it's a very small mistake. But you know what? That's usually what happens with our walk with Christ. It's usually a very small mistake that we make that throws us off track. That we don't understand what went wrong. And it's usually not the big stuff. I mean, you know, I've counseled people for many years. And I remember one couple says, well, you know, I cheated on my wife, but it was an accident. I'm sorry, it wasn't an accident. Okay? That was planned. But there are things that we do make mistakes in our testimony that are accidents. You know, I was, uh, not too long ago, out here on Main Street, in front of the church, and do you know when you're coming down, going east, there's that middle lane. Well, I wasn't thinking. I drove up, cars were in front, there was a red light, and I turned into that middle lane to make a left-hand turn. 
Well, it's not a turning lane. Now, if you go across the street, it is a turning lane, but this is not. Well, the guy sat there and he had a big old truck. He rolled down his windows and gave me a few words <laughs> and a few hand gestures. And I'm sitting there going, what is wrong with you? I'm in a turning lane. Then I realized that I was not. And what I basically did what? Cut him out. And that was a mistake. There's a difference between that. So let's look at these testimonies, and then let's talk about it. The intellectual, the person that has everything figured out. He has read, he has studied, he has understood. He knows what is right and wrong. So we have a doctor here. Let's listen to his testimonies. So you know, I was buying a new car, and then when I didn't do it, I'd go out and buy clothes or take a trip. And then I went through hobbies. You know, I did triathlons, I did running. I took up wine as a hobby. I mean, on and on the list goes. Dr. Greg Beeman was convinced he had everything he needed to find happiness. The successful career, the lifestyle, but it never seemed to be enough. It was a combination of you're sad, you're empty, and at the same time you're kind of angry and frustrated because you're thinking, well, why? You know, what's wrong with me? You know, why aren't I fulfilled? Why don't I feel like I have achieved what I worked my whole life for? So you're embarrassed, you're not going to tell anyone, so you keep it inside. And then what you end up doing is taking it out on other people. He also had all the answers. His wife Ruth explains. Yeah, I mean, he, was, he was good, but he had a short fuse. He was arrogant. He was always right. He's the type of person, he's his own person. He's the boss. You know, he always did well his whole life. He was always number one at everything. Greg was quick to take issue with others, including his Christian neighbors. Greg thought we're giving his family the cold shoulder. I'm going to get a Bible, and I'm going to prove to them that they're not practicing what they preach. Greg started <laughs> reading the Bible and was shocked by what he learned. I realized that Jesus was claiming to be God in the flesh, the God-man on earth. And I never heard that before. So that quickly got my attention because I realized that if it did happen, it was the most important event in human history, and if it didn't happen, then it was just a religious fairy tale that someone made up. So I quickly forgot about the neighbors and decided, hey, I need to find out if this really happened. I really got interested when I heard Luke's prologue where he says you know, he checked everything out because he's a doctor, and doctors would normally disprove miracles, not authenticate them. While Greg's curiosity was academic, Ruth had been on her own search for truth and accepted Christ as her savior. She knew her husband needed more than a subject to study. I was worried about his salvation. I would tell my friends in the Bible study, I'm worried about Greg. You know, he's never going to accept the Lord. When I told Greg, you know, there's a place called hell and it's real. And, you know, if you don't believe, you might go there. And I was praying for him. I really was. It got to a point where I was just like, I give up. You know, I was like, really? I'm like, God, you've got to you got to do something. Greg spent weeks studying and researching. He realized Christianity hinged on one event, the resurrection. I started for looking for every possible explanation that would say it didn't happen. You know, did Jesus, maybe he didn't die. Well, that wasn't true. Even in the Journal of the American Medical Association, doctors had concluded that he definitely died. Uh, maybe the apostles stole the body. I mean, maybe they were seeing hallucinations. All these different theories, but the problem was none of them were credible. None of them made sense. The only explanation from the historical facts, the way it was set up with the Roman guards and everything, was that the tomb was empty and he actually rose. The real thing that got me was the apostle Paul, because here's a guy, he's Jewish, he's killing Christians, he has nothing to gain. What in the world could make this guy go and be the greatest evangelist ever. There was only one explanation, and that was with, that he saw the risen Lord Jesus Christ. So when I looked at the resurrection, looked at the evidence of these guys and their changed lives, I said, I, I, I have to believe it. Now Greg had the answer, or at least he thought he did. Christianity is okay, and if he really did it, and if you believe, and he sees that you go to church and you're trying to do the right thing, and when you die, you'll go to heaven. I mean, what more could there be? Greg was about to find out. It started after he treated a walk-in patient at work. I went in and I told him if he had any questions to ask me. 
And he was just staring me like dead in the eye. And that's when he came out and just said, have you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And I about passed out. I wasn't expecting that. And I, all this other stuff was happening at the same time. I'm like, well, how does he know? Why is he asking me this? Who is this guy? And I kind of just bolted out of the room and says, I'll be right back. Because I didn't know what to do. A few nights later, Greg began thinking about his life. There were things in my life that I, you know, wanted to change, you know, the anger, the frustration, but I didn't have the power to change. And so it just kind of all culminated where I just kind of broke down crying and asking God to forgive me and basically just, you know, kind of repented of my sins and asked him to change me and that I, I wanted to, you know, live a new life. The very next morning, Greg noticed something was different. I was just like completely peaceful. I wasn't frustrated. I wasn't feeling angry. I felt content for no reason. So I quickly expected everything to dissipate and go back. But as I began to live that day, I realized, you know, hey, there's something really different. So if I was different and feeling completely different, I had to have been changed or something in my biochemistry of my body had to be changed. I said, well, maybe somehow my antihistamine got switched out for something like Valium. So I went to check on that something, of course. You know, that wasn't it. Greg found out why he felt different in the Book of Romans, chapter 6. Basically what it said in there was that when you become a believer and get saved, and the Holy Spirit comes into you, which was something I was completely unaware of, that the old person that you were somehow dies. And then it cross-referenced that to Galatians 5.22, which talks about how the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. And I'm like, you know, hey, that's it. That's, that's how I feel. I've got that list. Later that night, Greg told Ruth what happened. It was a miracle to me because I didn't ever think that Greg could ever change. He was suddenly concerned about other people, which shocked me. Greg went looking for the patient who had talked to him. The problem was his name wasn't on the schedule anymore. I mean, it was handwritten in ink, and I knew exactly what it was, and it's not there. And I checked for like the whole month, and the guy basically wasn't there. His record was completely wrong. There was no evidence that he ever came in the, in the office. Greg says while there's no doubt the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus are true, the real proof is in his changed life. I would say since the day I was saved, I've never felt alone, I've never felt empty, I've never felt all of that discontentment and stuff. I feel like I'm married to a different person. I feel like my old husband is not around anymore, and I've got this new husband who's awesome. For Greg, the truth is clear. Every other religion is man seeking God, Christianity is God seeking man. There's a real test for Christianity. You call on Christ, put him to the test. He won't just forgive your sins, but he's going to change you right now so that you know that it's true. That's a big difference. So if you notice, he wanted to find an intellectual answer. But you see, when you start praying, you keep, keep the lights out. When you keep praying and you go and you find it, Christ will come where you are. And this is the thing about a testimony. This is the thing that we need to look at. It doesn't matter how intelligent you think you are. No matter how much you try to search. And you're going to find that the scriptures are true. But you see, even his wife, where, where does she finally resign? To prayer. And when you have a loved one that's intellectual, that can try things, try to calculate everything out. You know, there's times when you just got to surrender it to God. And there's power in prayer, and there's power for those that the Lord is seeking. And when we surrender, there's been hundreds of testimonies. There's a testimony in Peru where the lady came up, and we were, this, her husband, we were on the same mission in South America. And her husband coming to, or his wife coming to church, and she, and they met down there, and they got married down there. And he said that she goes, when is he ever going to come to Christ? And, and he is so bad. I mean, he cusses me out when I go to church on Sunday morning. And he's got it all figured out. And we sit there and he says, you know what? We'll just pray for him. Well, 
He got out of the army, he retired, he moved to Florida, uh, to California. And it was about six months later, I got this call from her. And I sat there and I said, what's going on? She said, it's my husband. And I'm thinking divorce. I'm thinking, oh, this has really gone south. No, he decided to go to church all of a sudden. And now he accepted Christ. And next Sunday, he's going to get baptized. You see, we can't give up. When an atheist says, why should I believe Jesus? And all those other fairy tales. How many of you heard that? Those are fairy tales. Those are just things that are made up. Okay? Well, let's listen to this testimony. Five years ago, if you'd have told me I'd be sitting here you know, telling my story of salvation, I, I would have laughed right in your face, and I would have told you you were a crazy Christian. I didn't believe there was hope. I didn't believe in true love. Five years ago, I didn't even believe in myself. I heard people use the term atheist, and when I decided I knew what that meant, it just was kind of stuck in the back of my mind. I think that's where I fit better than anything. It was more just, there's no such thing as God. Like, if God really cares about people, and all these people say he does, he wouldn't let children starve, and cities burn down, and he wouldn't let people get into <coughs> they, where they hurt each other. I just thought Christians were meddlers, and they took away the rights of people, and they were just trying to create this new world order. I, I really viewed Christians as evil. I became really combative. Like, I'm not going to let them get away with this. This is a fairy tale. This is crap. Like, they cannot just come and fill people's heads with this fantasy. I faced life feeling like every day should be awesome, and it should be fun, but I did that with drinking and drugs and boyfriends. And if I died, I, just, I was buried. That was, that was all I really believed. I met my best friend who happened to be a Christian through a past relationship. She was the first friend that really started to talk about Christianity in a different way to me. I remember she had, she took the, her jacket off and she had this shirt on with bright pink lettering and said, Jesus is my homeboy. I was like, is that, is that blasphemous? <laughs> Can you really say that? And she just lived it. I mean, that was about the closest I had seen to someone really just demonstrating a love for Christ rather than just duty to him. And me and I just remember thinking, like, how am I ever going to be friends with her? If we're so divided on these things. I mean, we had debates. We had heated debates. I really let her have it. I was like, that is the most crazy hogwash I've ever heard. And because I knew her personally, I felt like she really did have my best in mind, that she wanted to break through those hard things with me. And in that time, I met a really awesome guy, and we got close, but uh, probably a little too close because um, I got pregnant only a few months after we met. I decided um, I gotta get rid of this problem. I went to a clinic and heard any of the options I had. And that was where a lot started to change. There was this picture this woman handed me just a dot but she explained to me that that was a, a baby I just started to wonder like how on earth that was going to become life you know this had to be something bigger than me up until then I had been so snarky to Christians but I started to lean in a little more and wonder if maybe what they're saying was true my best friend had approached me she basically said I, I understand you're really struggling for answers right now she said, I just want to tell you what if you just gave Christianity a try she says, because I go to church and I and you'll never know until you know, but I can tell you, there are answers. And she says, if you just gave it one month, you know, just come to church, and then you can just say at least you try it. I realize she cares more about this faith than, than being a popular friend right now. That said a lot, because we have been through a lot. For some reason, it just felt like, if I could just go, maybe I'll hear something, or at least I could just be alone for a little bit and think I hid myself up on the balcony, and I actually owned a Bible, from all my years of trying to disprove, and the worship team uh, performed canons by Phil Wickham. There were certain words I vividly, you know, remember reading them on the screen for the first time and just thinking, wow, that's, that's what I feel. You know, having been an atheist and, and believing in science, to, to read the moon and the stars declare who you are, it took me away from that happenstance and it, it put me in the position that just like I was created and my baby was created, you know, this whole world. This whole universe was created, and they all proclaim what what a power he is. And on a personal level, you know, it's, it says 
I'm so unworthy, but still you love me. For me, this didn't make any sense. You know, he can redeem good people and people who've made little mistakes and messed up and didn't say their bees and mouths or something like that. He doesn't redeem women who are pregnant out of wedlock, who have a path of emotional carnage behind them. And um, this song was just reminding me, you know, even if you're unworthy, he loves you. You know, we're all unworthy. You know, that's the beauty about grace. It, it's a gift. You don't get to pick and choose who gets it. You know, you just accept it. And it was after that song and a really powerful message, I finally accepted Christ. Um, but I remember just sitting there because it wasn't so easy. Because, I mean, it was almost like I felt bad for him to have to take on everything I lived. It's like I felt bad that Jesus <laughs> had to own, like me. And I just remember holding my belly and holding my breath, and I just said, are you sure that you want to save this one? Are you sure? I mean, I called him names. I laughed behind his back. I mocked him in public, and I realized I'm no different than all those people that were right in front of him, you know, as he bled. And if he went for them, you know, he went for me too. You know, it's, it's a struggle to believe every single day that um, <coughs> Jesus really did die for me. And, um, when someone challenges what I believe now, I, I remember being that person. I remember taking any opportunity I had to just stick it to the Christian. But now, I mean, my faith is so big, it's, it's like I know where you've been. I, I know that feeling, and I, I promise if you give me just a few minutes, I'll talk about it with you. I try to just get them one step closer, one question closer. As much as I know about what it's done for me, it's worth a shot to try to get them to come. Paul said, let no one judge you. You've seen the intellectual, the atheist, young lady with a baby going to church and ask him, God, do you really want to save somebody like me? You know, we've all come short of the glory of God. We've all have sinned. We've all had our times when we've turned our back. But you see, God never left us. That young lady, even though she did wrong, and even though she may have been judged because of what she did, there's a Christ that went to that cross. The same Christ that died for you and me, died for that young lady that had ended up having a baby out of wedlock, ended up having to raise a child, decided not to abort, but to have a baby. It's the same Christ that on the cross said, Father, forgive me. When an atheist finds Christ, you know, a lot of times it's the literature, a lot of times it's you know, people praying, and sometimes just historical studies. You know, the, one of the biggest historical studies is the resurrection of Jesus. And the biggest thing is the testimonies of the disciples. How many of you believe that people lie? How many of you are willing to be tortured and eventually kill for that lie. No. Once you start pulling fingernails out, the lie all of a sudden goes away. But you see, the disciples suffer to death. Testimony. What they witnessed was what? The truth. Reasonable, modern advances, all of this can explain the resurrection. Scientists have looked at the Bible and tried to disprove it. Atheists love to quote, misquote things in scriptures. But you see, Paul said, let no one judge you. Keep your faith. What is the thing that got her attention? Did you catch it? Was her Christian friend? And her friend was more concerned with what? <coughs> with her salvation 
than with her friendship. But she did it in a way that still brought this young lady to Christ. Now let's listen to a testimony of a young Christian that grew up in church. And this may render some of us me. Okay? Let's listen to her testimony. So I've been a Christian my whole life. And I've gone to church ever since I was a little kid. I got dedicated in the church. I got baptized. I've always believed in God and I've always been a Christian. Um, after one the youth camp, I ended up receiving the gift of tongues, which was pretty cool. But for some reason, I was still just going through the motions. Around 10th grade to 11th grade, I ended up going out with this guy from church. And I thought like it was crazy cool because, you know, he's from church. He, you know, he loves God, we go to the same church, we go to youth group together. Like, it was awesome. Like, this was a God-given boyfriend. Ever since then, I was really focused on my boyfriend. I didn't really realize that basically he was my whole world. Like, everything revolved around him. My priority was him. Going to church was to see my boyfriend. And that relationship lasted for about two and a half years. Um, throughout the relationship, the first year was awesome, it was great. Second year went by, it was still going good. Around the two and a half year mark was when things started to get more rocky. Like I said, I, I got really distant from God ever since I started going out with this guy, even though he was from church. So he pulled me so far away, and I let myself go really far away from where I should have been. Things between him and I, it was just terrible. Um, I remember him and I would always fight. There'd be times where I'd be crying all night, and our relationship wasn't based around God. It was God was the center, even though it should be. So after those two and a half years, that guy broke up with me because he said he didn't love me anymore. I was really heartbroken. Even though that relationship led me so far away from God, and it took me through so many different things, I still really had a real connection with him. And so once he broke up with me, and it totally broke me, I ended up blaming God. I got mad at him, and I got really angry, and I started questioning him, and I was like, why would you bring someone into my life when you knew I was going to get this attached to him, and then yet still take him away from me? Why would you do that? Why would you allow this hurt to happen to me? And during that time is when I started pushing myself even farther away from God. I had friends who don't necessarily believe in God the way that I have had. Life. And I just hung out with them to make myself feel better. I would go to church, but I would just be going through the motions. I would just be there just to be there because my family was there. It wasn't necessarily for me. It wasn't helping me or anything. So I didn't want anything to do with it at that moment because I was just too sad and too stuck in my sorrows to just even be myself. After that moment, for some reason, some way, somehow, I had a revelation. I was like, wait, wait a minute. I think that God did this for a reason. That maybe, maybe some reason, maybe somehow that he knew down the road that if my boyfriend back then and I stayed together, that we wouldn't have, we would be just who knows what, who knows where, in some kind of crazy situation. And I heard God just, he just sent a peace over me. And it was amazing. And usually people got a breakup, and especially when it's a two and a half year relationship, it takes like six months to get over something, or a year, or a couple years to get over someone. But I got over that relationship within like three months, and I was okay, and I was completely whole. And that was only because God gave me that peace and that love. He was telling me that it's going to be okay, that I did this for a reason, that I have a reason for you, that the reason that I took that guy out of your life because he wasn't the right one for you. <coughs>
because no matter what has happened in my past and how much hurt I have been through, that even coming out of that relationship, even after, um, even after hating him and being angry for him, and with everything, <coughs> and blaming him for ruining my life, you know, that he still loves me. And that's what's amazing. I came out of that, that relationship. <coughs> that even though I've been a Christian my whole life, it wasn't until then that I finally understood what it meant to be a child of God. And that was when I finally realized who He is and how much He loves me. Like nothing can take you away. <coughs> nothing. So what's the message today? God changes hearts. God changes hearts. Salvation. Salvation. But if you notice something, God is in pursuit. He's chasing people. With the uh, doctor, it took the wife. With the atheist, it took a friend. With a girl, young lady that grew up in church, it took a bad relationship. But God turned it. You see, when we open up to God, and one thing we need to understand as Christians, you know, we fail, we make mistakes. But you see, there's a God that loves us. It doesn't matter. When he went to that cross, he says, I loved you before you knew me. So you can imagine how much more that love can be for those that know him and that love him. Many Christians have fallen away. Like her, she'd go to church and she would be what? There. But she's not. I remember when I joined the army at 18. I went to, to the chapel, I went to church, and a chaplain asked me one day, why do you come? And I said, well, my dad's a pastor. He said, okay, well, why are you coming to church? Well, my dad's a pastor. And he kept asking. And then finally I said, well, honestly, I'm here because this is where you're supposed to be at 11 o'clock on Sunday, isn't it? I mean, that's where everybody goes at 11 o'clock on Sunday, that's where I grew up. But then he says, but why are you coming? And I said, <coughs> and what he was trying to tell me was, we don't come because of friends. We don't come because of tradition or because the way I did. But even when we do that, even when Jim Locke was at church because that's just the way it's supposed to be at 11 o'clock, what changed me was because I was at church and I did hear the word and faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. <coughs> I want to look at Luke and we'll close. And before we close, we'll talk about the yellow card in a minute. Luke, chapter 24, verse 44, page 16 and 29. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. And all these things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding and they might comprehend the, the scriptures. This is where we come as Christians when the Holy Spirit opens up and comes to us. This is where when we understand what is happening in our faith. <coughs> now, when we turn, well, I'm going to turn these cards. Now, there's a mistake in these cards. Now, without blurting it out, has anybody found it? 
Okay? These are salvation scriptures. <clears throat> now, I'm going to go over it real quick, and then we're going to find the mistake. And the why it's important is you need to understand that people give out bad stuff sometimes. And sometimes it's very minute, but it has a big, a big impact on what the scriptures actually says. Let's go to John 3.16. I haven't even heard of that. Well, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, what? Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We know that, right? So God died, but what's the key on that? For God so loved, what? Only those that come to First Christian Church. No. <clears throat> so he, he died for the world. So can you imagine when Jesus died? His love for the world. He died for us when we were yet sinners. Because he loved us. Look what Paul says in Romans. For all, for all have sinned and come what? Short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. And it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So we cannot claim righteousness. We cannot claim, well, I've been a good person. The Bible says very clearly that we're not. Now what's the remedy of sins? For the wages of sin. What does the card say? <coughs> when? How many times do we think that we win when we sin? How many people believe that they win when they sin? Are there ever been any cheaters around? Have you ever cheated in school? Have you ever done anything because why would you do that? Because you think you're going to get ahead. Why would you lie about a co-worker? <coughs> Trying to get ahead. <clears throat> I put that in there really in a, on, on actions it originally started off as a, as a mistake. And then Sherry made the cards, and when she was still here, she says, can I fix that? I said, no. <clears throat> because the difference between sin and win is what? Jesus. One letter, right? Yep. <clears throat> but one letter will change where we end up in eternity. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. This card has everything you need to show someone on how to become a Christian. These, if you memorize these verses, you will be able to defend your faith when you talk to an intellectual, when you talk to an atheist, or when you're talking to someone that grew up in church and has just what? Falling away. You know, we have peaks and we have valleys. How many times have we been in the peak? How many times have we been felt that we're so close to God, so close to this Jesus, that we can almost smell his presence? And then there's those days when God is so far away that we wonder if he even exists. And when we're down in that valley, we turn on the TV. And what happens? It gets worse. <laughs> because you see, the devil knows when you're at that peak. And he's trying to do everything he can to bring you down. If you remember these simple scriptures, when the devil comes to you, you're not worthy. That is true. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We know that. But you see, Jesus knew that when he went to the cross. Do you think that Jesus did not know the sins of that Roman soldier, that centurion, that was putting the nails through his hands? Do you not think that Jesus knew of that centurion that put the spear up into his rib? Do you not think that Jesus knew when the Jews in that crowd yelled, Crucify him! 
Do you not think that Jesus knew when Israel rebelled against the God that gave them a nation? Don't you think that Jesus knows when we sin and come short of the glory of God? Today's message is very simple. No matter what your walk of life is, no matter if you grew up in a church, you're an atheist, or you're highly educated or uneducated, <clears throat> there's room for you at that cross of Jesus. Let us pray. <coughs> oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, I don't know where we're at today. I don't know where each individual is in their faith. I ask that the Holy Spirit would touch them, would fill them with your, with your heart. Lord, let us see with your eyes. Let us have the heart of Jesus. And let us have the words to speak. We have loved ones that don't know Jesus, but we will know how to reach them. We have enemies that hate us, but we will learn how to love. We have people that don't want to talk to us, but we will learn how <coughs> to reach them. Touch us, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Before we